Duel of Ages is a game of adventuring and combat through time and space, bringing together a wide range of characters in a struggle of strength, wits, strategy, and tactics. It's unlike any other game. Inside the box you get rules, a bunch of cardboard, some cards, player aids, and dice. The game revolves around individual characters who each have cards and a corresponding chip. Each character has a name and description, honor and respect, age, special abilities, and their stats, including speed, health, melee, damage, aim, and so on. The color of the stats indicates their prowess in set stat, with black being the worst and white being the best. The equipment cards can be gained throughout the game that provide attacks, melee strength, transport, added defense, and even pets that can be unleashed on your opponent. Each equipment card has a name and description, a category, when and if they go away, and requirements that must be met to use the card. Weapons and armor also have stats. A ranged weapon, for example, will have an attack versus defense rating, range, target type, op fire type, and damage. P is permanent, K is removed from the game if it's used to kill a character, one is usable only once. Equipment cards are given to characters, not teams, and are kept face down until revealed to be used. Be sure to check that your character meets the requirements before trying to use them, just in case. All challenges and attacks in the game are done according to the challenge chart. To find the challenge number, take the color of your stat on the left across to the opposing stat to find the challenge number. This is the number needed to roll on 2d6 to squeak. Modifiers are always added or subtracted from this number. Under this number is either a pass or an amaze, which are good. Above this number is a fail or a fop, which is bad. Another concept important to the game is dismissal and banishment. Dismissal means that the controlling player rolls 1d6 and places the dismissed character on a dome of that number. Banishment is the opposing player rolling the die and placing the banished character. To set up the game, first split up the players into two teams, white and black. Then decide the number of characters each team will be using, the number of platters to be used, and the game length by either time or turn count. I prefer eight characters per team on three platters and a variable turn count using a deck of cards. Deal the teams their characters and have them read them thoroughly, but do not reveal them. Next, each team picks one platter with white picking first. Shuffle the remaining platters face down. To build the map, the black player places any three map pieces. This includes any keys, one of the face down platters, or their chosen platter. Then the white team follows suit and back and forth until all the agreed upon platters are placed, requiring the two pick platters, along with at least six dome keys, all four labyrinth keys, and the team bases if playing with sets other than just set one. Also, the map cannot have any open notches. If agreed upon, the characters are revealed now, but I prefer not to reveal them until they are dismissed into the game. When the characters are revealed, they draw equipment cards if they start with any, and their chit is collected. Place the team markers in labyrinths as appropriate. Put challenge cards near their labyrinths, and deal two equipment cards to each of the team's vaults if using the team bases and play is ready to begin. The white team takes the first turn. Each turn is broken into seven phases, and all characters on a team complete a phase before moving to the next phase. For the first turn, the only phase that will take place is reinforcement. The phases are free action, fire, move, opportunity fire, melee, adventure, and reinforce. Once the white team has completed all phases, the black team does the same, and a new game turn starts for the white team. During the free action, if a character's card lists a free action, it may be done now. During the fire phase, a character with a ranged attack, either innate or via equipment, may now make one attack using their ranged attack as long as there are no enemy characters in their space. To make a ranged attack, one announces the attack, checking line of sight and ensuring the target is within range. Now find the stats used for this attack on the equipment card and compare the colors of those stats on the challenge chart to find the challenge number. The attacker then rolls two dice and checks the result against the challenge number. When attacking, a squeaker better hits. Anything above the challenge number is a miss. If the target is hit, then roll for damage. To do this, compare the damage stat on the attacker against the armor stat of the target to get the challenge number. Roll two dice and compare the results on the damage row. This is the modifier for the attacker's damage number. A pass will do that damage, where a squeak does the damage number minus one. If a damage is done, indicate that somehow on the character card. During the move phase, any character who did not fire can move up to their speed rating. Certain terrain types on the map will require more speed points to be spent to enter them or not be enterable at all. If a character moves onto a tower or an opposing player's space, they have to stop there. Also, a character attempting to get into an opposing team base has to stop on the space outside the entrance to the base and attempt entry during the adventure phase. 
During movement, characters can also pick up equipment that was dropped by spending two speed points on the space containing said equipment. They can also exchange cards with characters on their team. To do this, both characters have to be in the same space, and each spends two speed points per exchanged card. During opportunity fire, the opponent gets to fire at you more or less simultaneously to your movement. Opportunity fire can only happen if the character shooting doesn't have an opponent's character in their space. First, they'll check the op fire rating on their weapon. Zero rating cannot be used for op fire. One is one shot. Two plus can fire more than once, but only one shot per target and per space. Op fire attacks and damage are carried out like ranged fire. Next is the melee phase, which happens on each player's turn, but each player gets to attack each melee phase. Melee occurs when players from opposing teams are in the same space during that phase. Melee attacks are voluntary and simultaneous unless the character's card says otherwise. A character can either attack with their natural melee stat or with a weapon they are currently carrying. Melee is always resolved as melee versus react. Roll for the attack and again for the damage. When killed in simultaneous melee, the character still deals their damage before dying. If a character is killed, their equipment remains in the space where they died and they vanish. Next is the adventure phase. If one of your characters is on their team's guardian in a labyrinth, or Lith Alliance, on a tower space at the enemy headquarters gate, or inside of either headquarters, that character can adventure. To challenge a guardian, draw a card from the deck of that age, or use the face-up one if there is one there. On the card will be a challenge stat. You will use this stat from the character taking the challenge and roll against it, then fulfill the result. Remember, characters get a plus to their challenge number if facing a challenge of their own age. Challenges will gain the character's cards, advance the guardian, dismiss, banish, or imprison the character depending on the challenge outcome. If the challenge result advances the guardian, place the card face up on the bottom of that age's deck. Otherwise, the card stays face up on the top of the deck to be faced again. If a particular challenge is holding you up, you may beg for mercy by getting a character to the red eye in that particular labyrinth, placing the card on the bottom of the deck and dismissing the character who begged for mercy. The Lith Alliance and some of the other adventure keys work in a similar way, except the challenge will be against the stat behind where the guardian currently is or on the space landed on if there isn't a guardian. Towers all have specific challenge stats and do a variety of things. The Great Vortex, for example, is a strength challenge and can heal a character on a squeak or better. Adventuring is also when characters gain admission into enemies' bases by facing the challenges there, either discarding a card and being decent or honorable, facing a stealth challenge, or being respected. The spaces inside the base, the prison, vault, and headquarters itself all show the challenge stat on them that must be faced. Pillaging inside an enemy base can be very fruitful if pulled off, and destroying their headquarters is worth a point, which has obvious benefits. The last phase is reinforcement. This only happens when there are characters who haven't yet entered the game. Dismiss two characters onto the map during reinforcement as long as you have characters not yet in play. Pick the character to be dismissed before making the roll, and that character is placed before making the next roll. Play continues until either one side has no remaining characters in play, or the time or turns expire. One point is given to the team whose guardian has advanced more in each labyrinth, one point for each of the other keys, one point to the team with the most characters still in play, and destroyed enemy headquarters gains a point for their destroyer. Whoever has the most points is the winner. In the case of a tie, the game continues in sudden death until one team gains another point. Now we'll go over some basic strategy. Strategy starts in this game before play even begins. First thing you need to do is read your character's card, get to know their abilities, and play to their strengths. To me, this is the most important thing to do. Platter and key placement. One can gain a great advantage by putting their base in a tough spot to enter, like putting your base in a fire of the closet, or bunching the labyrinths that you'll want to get to, or making it inconvenient to get to the other keys. Items. Get your items to the characters that can use them best, or use them at all. This takes some patience and some planning, but will really pay off. Having a long rifle in the hands of someone with a poor aim isn't going to be much of a benefit. Moving and fighting. Try to only fight when you're sure you have the upper hand. Don't be afraid to run when you need to. Along with that, pay close attention to both sides' opportunity fire capabilities. If you can cover obvious routes with someone who isn't going to be in danger, take full advantage of that. Also, try to stay out of range when you're moving, especially when an opponent character has unrevealed cards. Labyrinths. If you're playing to win, concentrate on labyrinths. This is really the crux of the game. It's not about fighting, it's about adventuring. Having killed or imprisoned more opponents is worth as many points as advancing one guardian. Use people good at adventuring to adventure, especially in their Aegis Labyrinth, and have fighters cover them. Get ahead in the keys and park someone tough or tough to hit in them. Then you can start picking people off without having to worry about adventuring. 
The key to concentrate on when doing this is the Colonial Labyrinth. The Colonial Labyrinth is a point itself, and controlling the Tower of Maneuver can give you a huge advantage even if you don't use the tower yourself. Get someone tough parked in there, your people will have access to pass while holding up your opponent. I especially like Agent 911 for this task. Those are a few broad tips, but an excellent resource for those looking to delve deeper is Solon's articles on BoardGameGeek.com. He has a broad strategy article where a lot of these ideas came from, as well as explorations of character types and individual characters' strengths and weaknesses. Links for these can be found below. And that's Duel of Ages. It's a truly unique game. It offers such an open game system in such a cool world with so much space to explore. If you get into the game and get to know your characters and how they operate, it can really be a rewarding experience. Playing outside of the optimal strategy because of what you think your characters would really do can add a whole nother level. You don't have to play it optimally to enjoy the ride, or even to win.